Hi, everybody, and welcome. I'm Phil Moran. I'm artistic director here at the Woodtut Museum. I'm really thrilled that you came out this evening to hear this presentation. It's a really monumentous occasion for us because we have such a distinguished designer and type practitioner and appreciator uh, who has uh, agreed, who agreed last year to design a typeface in honor of Mardell Dubeck, who is also with us this evening. And for us, for us as a museum, it's a really exciting merging of the 19th century and the 21st century when we can have uh, two such amazing practitioners in the same room together. I've been a fan of Louise's work for many, many years. And uh, one of the things that I so appreciate being able to do is to call one of my heroes on the phone or send her an email and say, would you be willing to design a typeface for us? And you, you get a little nervous and your palms are sweaty. And the response was, sure, exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point. So we was that are. My, was that what I said? OK. Yeah, I think there's, <laughs> maybe it's just one. If there was one. You, yeah, you seem like a one exclamation We put a lot of them on the poster, though. That's true. Maybe that was what I was thinking of. So anyway, um, uh, Louise was gracious enough to come and speak at Ways Goose last year. And um, we are thrilled to have her back tonight. Um, we are not only uh, going to enjoy a presentation by Louise and a little bit of Q&A that we'll be doing uh, after her presentation, but we've also got a beautiful, uh, this beautiful poster that she designed that we have on press tonight. So after the talk, we're going to go over to the press room and we'll direct you there so you can see this beautiful project in progress. Big shout out to Stephanie and Jim for doing an absolutely exquisite job with that poster. And also a profound thanks to uh, Georgie uh, brilski leash and Mardell for cutting such beautiful types. So we're excited yes. to look at their work this evening. And with that, I will turn it over to Louise. Oh, thank you, Bill. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, so next slide, as they say. This, <laughs> I've never done it like this before. Um, I, when I was 16 years old, I took my first trip to Italy. I went back, I went with my parents. It was their first trip back since they had left for America. It's something that I had never forgiven them for. And um, the very first thing I saw when I arrived was this billboard, which totally changed my life. It was my thunderbolt moment. I, I saw this billboard. I didn't even know what it was advertising, but I had never seen anything like this before. And uh, for me, it was the pivotal moment when I fell in love all at once with food type and all things Italian. I later found out that this was for bocce um, chocolates by Perugina. And they still use this design, although it's been ruthlessly updated over the years. And the company was bought by a Swiss company, but that's another story. So um, from there, I became uh, obsessively um, collecting anything with Italian type on it. A anything, anything of that nature was, was magical to me, and I just, I just kept collecting. I didn't really know why. I, I, I barely knew what graphic design was at that point, but I started to catch on to that. So, thank you. So then I started my studio after being art director of Pantheon Books for 11 years, and I decided to do a, uh, a book on Italian Art Deco of all, the, of all of the material that I had been collecting over these years. And I did it with my husband, Stephen Heller, who was here with me at Ways Goose um, this fall. And um, what we did is we col collected and selected the work together. Steve would do the writing, and I would do the design in my studio. And this grew to be a uh, series of books. Thank you. Uh, on Art Deco graphic design that was published by Chronicle. But um, I started with Italian because that, of course, was what was closest to my heart. But for all of these books, um, I had two rules ab about um, how they would be done in terms of the design. One is that we would always put a woman on the cover, and the other was that we would always do a custom font. I didn't even want to say a design of font because I I don't really know how to design a font, which I learned in doing this, this process. <laughs> but, I, um, 
what we did is for each book, we would come up with a font that was based on some image in the book. And we, we would never make it a complete alphabet. We would just make the letters that we needed. So there were no numerals, there was no punctuation, and there, there wasn't every letter. But there was enough so that we could do the, the chapter headers and the, the title of the book. And, um, and that's, that's where that went. So we go to the next one. So for the Italian book, I, this was, I think, when I really began to totally appreciate futurism and especially the unique typographic style. This is a very famous book that was done by Marinetti, who was the chief architect of Italian futurism, along with Tullio d'Albisola, um, which was actually an, a nom de guerre. You go to the next one, you can see what the, these are, this, these are the two guys. Marinetti is the one on the left. You can see he was quite a, a gadfly. And, uh, <laughs> and um, Tullio, um, if you go to the next one, Tullio came from this, uh, this very well-known family that produced ceramics. Their, name was, their surname was Mazzotti, and they came from the town of Albisola, but he decided to take that as his artistic name, I guess. Um, and I just found this by, by chance when I, was, when I was researching the book. But anyway, this, this style of this very chunky style of, of typography that was a little playful, a little unusual, that was quint for me quintessentially Italian, always captured my heart. And there were no fonts like this. So if I ever wanted to do anything that looked like that, I had to draw it myself. Oh, and here are some other examples. This, because uh, Tullio was in the ceramics business, he combined some of this typography with ceramics. So these were, um, these were candlesticks for the nightstand that say Buona Notte on, on the two. Okay, next. And then, of course, uh, Fortunato de Pero was, was equally famous as an illustrator, but also did some typography for any, anything from Campari to covers for Vanity Fair, because he did spend a few years living in New York. Go to the next one, and this is a this is a facsimile edition that I have of, of, of his probably best known book that was actually bound with these these screw bolts, which are quite charming. But again, there is that beautiful, very geometric um, typography, and the futurists were all about speed and motion and and modernism, and that all came through in the typography, which then. Oh, and this is one of his many logos. He, he changed his logo as probably even more often than I do. Um, uh, and he also loved red and black as I do. So, next. But he did do a lot of work for Campari. He actually designed the, the little Campari bottle, the Campari soda bottle that uh, he designed that, I think, in 1929, and it's still in use today, which is pretty, pretty amazing. But you can only buy that in Italy. But then you would also find this style of typography for things as, um, as prosaic as a, a cherry festival in a town in northern Italy. But, uh, and and each, these were all drawn by hand uh, because there were no fonts as far as I knew. But, and, then, and then, of course, the, the fascist party um, decided to adopt this style for, for their own uses, especially for graphics for, um, for young fascists, for fascist youth. So, so this is a, a, a little handbook for the young fascist party. We can go to the next one, as is this one. And then this is for Gioventù Fascista, it's for teenage fascists. And you see like it's not only the type, but then, <laughs> but then the motion of the, the locomotive and a quote from Mussolini, of course. Next. And yes, there were, we, have, we have several covers of Gioventù Fascista, and they're all quite, quite uh, powerful. Next. Another. OK, next one. And this one I was very excited to find, because after the um, Italian Art Deco book came out, um, I convinced my publisher to do 
a, 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 both a calendar and an Italian Art Deco address book. <laughs> Except then I really painted myself into a corner because I had to find an image for every letter of the alphabet. <laughs> and, when I, and when I got to X, it was a little bit difficult, but thanks to Mussolini, who started numbering the years with Roman numerals starting when he came into power, uh, we had Anno X that I could use for the X page, X and Y, which was, which was very helpful. So in the meantime, I was, um, I've always been photographing signs uh, in Italy, and especially once the, the dollar started to weaken and the flea markets were, were starting to dry up um, and everybody was going to Italian eBay instead, I, I started focusing more and more on photographing the signage because it, it was all this beautiful typography that was going to disappear. So. And, and this was always meant to be nothing more than for my own reference and enjoyment because I started out shooting these, these uh, signs in 35 millimeter slides and then we went to point and shoot snapshots. But then as the technology improved and I, and I started shooting digitally, for the first time I realized that I could consider putting these into a book. So this book was published uh, two years ago, Grafica della Strada. Next. And in this book, there are a number of examples of futurist typography as signage. These, these were all in Rome. And they were all unique examples. This is the Rome uh, Zoo, which is in, in the Borghese Gardens. And there is only this one sign that was handled in this style, which I find really fascinating. And I can even forgive whoever put this, put, attached this sign to the wall for hanging the U backwards. <laughs> And also the sloppy job they did of repainting it, especially around the E. But other than that, I thought it was a very nice job. And then the next one, uh, at the top, this is a spread from the book. At the top is a sign from uh, a train station, which is not far from the zoo sign. And this is the only train station in Rome that has a sign like this. And uh, every other train station there just has a regular sign. And I, I always thought it was just a goof. I, I, couldn't, I, I was really surprised when I found out that this sign really was from the 20s, but it was indeed from the fascist era. And it's in this futurist style yet again. Next. And then this is from a housing project called Garbatella, which is on the outskirts of Rome, that was started in the early 20s and then was taken over by the fascists. And it's a series of, of uh, apartment buildings that um, are still in use now. And, they, and each building had a lot number and would have a plaque with the lot number on it with this wonderful futurist typography again. But if you look carefully on the left-hand side, you'll see that um, there's something missing. Can anybody guess what that is? It was the fascist symbol. It was <laughs> that was uh, after Mussolini's fall. Um, they were all removed with great patriotic vigor. Um, OK, next one. So from there, I started doing my own projects that would either give me an excuse to go to Italy or at least use uh, my my enthusiasm for, for Italian typography. So this was for my publisher, Princeton Architectural Press, who had published some of my other books. And they started doing a gift line, and they wanted to know if I had any ideas. And I have been collecting Italian pencils for a long time. And I loved the double-sided pencils that had um, red on one side and blue on the other uh, for teachers to correct homework. But since I prefer red and black, I decided to do it that way. So, um, so we started out with these pencils, and then we decided to do colored pencils called Tutti Frutti. Mm -hmm. And these have been doing remarkably well, to my great surprise, uh, because I was not aware of the coloring book rage. That's you know, right, OK. And everybody who has a coloring book needs colored pencils. So, so that's been wonderful. So right now we're working on the next one, which is going to be um, metallic colored pencils, so hopefully those will work as well. <laughs> and that, so those were followed by uh, this, th this box of cards, Quattro Parole Italiane, Four Italian Words. Um, yeah, here they are. I'm sure you know them all. Next. And then uh, somewhere along the line I did this book, Italianissimo. It's, the only way I can describe this is it's all the things that we love and sometimes love to hate about 
Italy, mostly love, of course, like, oh, this is really, <laughs> this should be second. This is, whenever anybody asks me why, and they say, well, you know, you're always talking about Italy. Why didn't you move there? Why didn't you ever move there? And I said, I could answer that in three words. Fate la coda, which is the Italians' inability to form a line. This is their <laughs> idea of boarding a train. It really drives me crazy. It's gotten a little bit better. Um, but but then, uh, then the rest of the things are the things we love, like hand gestures, and these, this gives you a guide to all of those. And um, every summer I teach at a master's workshop uh, in typography in Rome, which I highly recommend. It's through the School of Visual Arts, but it's open to everyone. And it used to be, uh, it's, it's a two-week program. It used to be a week in Venice and a week in Rome, and now it's just a week, uh, two weeks in Rome. But for the years that we were also going to Venice, the, I think the best part of that was that we would go to Tipoteca, which is heaven for anyone interested in typography. And, oh, and this is, this is the Rome. It was actually, once we, we decided to just do Rome for two weeks, it was a lot easier to do a poster. It's hard to do, <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to do those two different cities as, as one poster. So at Tipoteca, we went with the students, and of course they're very generous about letting us just go through all the, the, the drawers and see what we could find. And, we, and I found this futurist typeface that I didn't even know existed. So we, uh, we printed it out, and it was, it was quite wonderful. Um, and then once, um, after, after we did that, I, was, I found this in one of my Italian type books, which is quite different, and I liked it a lot better. It's less condensed. But there weren't a lot of characters to work with. So when Bill generously gave me the invitation to, to uh, do a font, I immediately thought about this, because I thought it would be fun to figure out all the missing letters. But of course, I had never done anything like that before. <laughs> so this is um, my senior designer, Nick Masani, who is Italian. So it was very helpful to have him working on the project, especially because when we were trying out uh, the letters as words, it, it, it was much more interesting to look at Italian words. <laughs> so <laughs> of course, but of course, we didn't have all the letters for the Italian words. So, um, so and because I really didn't quite know if there are certain ways you're supposed to approach this, I did, I did it the way I do everything. I just decided to wing it. So we, for example, this is when we were looking at how to design the H, we just put it with the other, some of the other letters and, and then just tried different options and just to see how they would look. And then once we, once we agreed on that, then we would look at it with other letters. And it was very tedious. And I'm sure there's an easier way to do it, but this is the way that we did it. And it was, it was still very enjoyable. And, but every time I look at it, I think, I bet there's another way that we could have designed that letter. But I can keep thinking about that forever. Next. Oh, yeah, so here's some more examples. <laughs> See, it always looks better in Italian. <laughs> but um, OK. But, but and, and when. Uh, Whoa, what did I just drop? Um, <clears throat> but the, the best thing about doing this project was that um, it gave me the opportunity to celebrate two of my, my most important causes in my life, Italy and women. So I was so glad to meet Mardell and, and know that this, this font was going to be named after her and dedicated to her. And it was great to be here at Ways Goose and watch her actually cutting cutting the wood and to, to really understand how the whole process works. It was equally exciting to come here tonight and see the poster in, in the works, which it looks much better than uh, what we put together, which is, I think is, oh, oh, no, no, almost there. This is the proof that I got um, a couple of weeks ago that was also very exciting. And I guess it's hard to see here, but Bill asked me to mark it up, so we just, we just marked up a few things that we noticed. But, I never, really, I never really had made the leap in my mind that, because that, I kept thinking of this as a digital font, because that's the way we've been treating it. But then even to do the poster, which is the next one, to design this poster on the computer for something that's going to be done in wood type in a very specific size, 
with limited punctuation. I mean, this, this is very simple, but it was still very challenging to try to figure out how it would fit on the size of paper that you had given me, et cetera. But, um, but it worked out, and it looks much better on press than it looks here. So I hope you all get to see that. OK, we... now it's time for you to interrogate me. Yes. Can everybody hear OK? Very OK, very good. You did a very good job, Bill. I, I know up and down, and that was the only arrow direction that I needed to follow. So that was lovely. Thank you. Um, so the, the, the first, the, the, what, what I was very intrigued with in terms of watching the project evolve was this whole notion of going from analog to digital, and that was a really exciting thing for me. And then it got me also thinking about your career as a designer and this notion of what is a font versus what is a drawing of letters, and that's a, it's a lovely distinction. So mm -hmm. um, the questions that I'm, uh, I had shared with Louise in advance, but the first one that I wanted to ask, and this is, this is the things that I was curious about, and so I hope you're equally curious about them. We'll do Q&A at the end, too. When were you first exposed to European design, and was it love at first sight? Yes. <laughs> well, that's uh, actually the, uh, I, think, I, I think my first exposure was that first slide of the bocce poster, because I grew up in New Jersey. I had never seen anything like that before. <laughs> you know, why would you have a billboard that, that had, uh, you know, this romantic image on there in one word and it didn't show the product, you know? And, and it was beautiful typography. So, so for me, and it was very romantic, and, um, and I think that really kind of set me on my path. And, and I, think, uh, I think probably all I've done in design has sort of been, uh, as a backlash to having grown up in New Jersey and lived with bad typography. <laughs> but you're also full-blooded Italian. Well, your yes. Parents, your parents right. are immigrants? Yeah. But they didn't know anything about type. <laughs> so. Were they good I cooks? Had, that was yes, that they were very I'm, good cooks. I'm moving away from yeah. the script. I've got to stay on script. Yeah. Okay. Well, cooking is all part of it. Yeah, all right. Fair enough. Did the design studios that you worked for early in your career embrace modernist design the way you did? And did you ever have battles over this? Well, I worked, I worked for Herb Lubellin for a couple of years. And, um, and I loved being there. I loved watching him uh, and his process and, and understanding how, how, he, how his thought process worked. Um, but when, when I was there, it was in the late 70s. And everybody was you know, pushing type together as close as possible. Whenever we ordered type, it was always marked TNT, tight not touching. That was the big thing then. And, um, but during, it was during that time that I was there, I, really, I started looking at, at um, older examples of, of uh, typography. And it looked so much better when there was letter spacing. So I was the renegade. I, would, I wouldn't use any ITC faces while I was working there, which was blasphemy. I mean, because he was a partner in ITC. But I was just looking at all, at, uh, does anyone familiar with photo lettering? That was the big, yeah. That was the big um, uh, photo typography house in New York. And Ed Bengat was, was one of the uh, designers. And he was, one, he was my teacher when I went to SVA for a semester. And uh, I was just drawn to all of those, all, all of those fonts that were n not available anywhere else that were all from the, the early 1900s. And, and actually, and, that's, and it was in the photo lettering book that I found a version of that futurist style. So. Was Herb a gentle critic? Was he a, a forceful critic? Was he an easy guy to work for? Yeah, he was pretty easy to work for, and he was very taciturn. So, you know, he he never spoke, and it just <laughs> that made it very easy. <laughs> <laughs> the best bosses ever. Yes. Um, uh, who are the women designers that you admire? Oh, I had a feeling you'd ask me that question, Bill. So I have a few <laughs> slides right here. <laughs> just let's see who comes up first. Does anybody know who this is? 
C.P. Pinellas. C.P. Pinellas. Very good. Yeah. Um, she was a pioneer. She uh, was not American. She, oh, I was supposed to look this up before I came. She was from Vienna, I think, right? Austrian, sounds right. Yeah. Um, and um, was uh, widowed twice. Her first husband was William Golden from CBS, and then after that was Will Burton. She survived them both. But she, if you go to the next slide, it's an example of her work. She was the art director of Charm magazine in the 40s when, you know, no women were art directors. And she just insinuated herself into the business and didn't take any, anything from anybody. And I thought that that was great. And at my very first job, uh, she, she was friendly with the owners of, uh, of the business. And she used to stop in all the time. And it was. You, you met C.B. Pinellas? Yes. Tech, can, what was that like? My was first she, job. Was she charming? Was she was she... very charming and, and, and very, you know, very straightforward. And, you know, she, she was her, her own breed. You know, she, she wasn't going to put up with anything from anybody. And, and I think it was, I mean, that was a very difficult time to, for a woman to be able to do that. It's boys club, yeah. Very much so. Yeah. And I think maybe the fact that she was European helped her get away with it. I don't know. But she, she just didn't stand for it. So that's one. Next one is, anybody know who that is? April Griman? You're close. It's, it's the right coast. It's uh, Deborah Sussman. Oh, very good. Who unfortunately passed away within the last year. But she, she was a, very much a, an LA designer, very creative. She worked for the Eames uh, when she was right out of school. If you go to the next one. But she, I think she was best known for doing the Los Angeles Olympics in the early 80s, I think. Very, and very colorful and very unusual. Environment and graphics. That was yeah. her, she was straddled two and three dimensional it's beautifully. Yes. yes. Worked up until the last, I mean, she, she had cancer and nobody even knew it. She just kept working right up until the last, the last. She was hilarious. I had the pleasure of meeting her two years ago. Oh, that's good. There's one more. Paula. Paula Cher, yes, a good friend of mine, who's, um, who was only a few years older than me, but I've always looked uh, to her as a role model. model. You know, she started out at CBS Records and just did amazing work, and then started her own studio, and then, and then went to her third act as, a, as the first woman partner in Pentagram. And if you go one more, that's a typical example of where she loves wood type. We got to get so her bold. here, too. Yeah, you should get her here. Uh, next question. Is the type-driven uh, signage that you document in your books in danger of being lost, or is there a recognition of its value? And are some cities more concerned with it than others? Yes, definitely. Um, the interesting thing about the Italian book, which was the one that came out first, was that um, I was very, very surprised. It got a huge amount of press in Italy, which I was really not expecting at all. And you know, every newspaper and magazine wrote something about it, and they all said the same thing. They all said, gee, we walk past these signs every day, and we've never really taken note of them. And it took an American to come here and show it to us, <laughs> which I thought was great. Um, and it seems like it has fostered, I'd, I'd like to think, it has fostered a, uh, an appreciation and, and a wake-up call to some degree. There are certain cities in Italy that have always seemed to have a respect for their signage. Like, if you go to Lucca and Torino in particular, they, like Lucca, one of my favorite signs is um, for a, a pasticceria biscotteria that is uh, now, it's a store that sells running shoes, but it still has the sign up there. I mean, they, and I've, I've repeatedly asked in both of these cities, you know, do you have a law that says that you can't get rid of the sign? They said, no, but we think it's beautiful. That's so, reassuring. Yes, and there's a lot of that in Torino as well, and I, I asked there too, and same thing. It's like, no, but the sign is nice, so. So they keep it because I don't I don't know what there is to be done about this. You can't leave all the signs. And, and my next book is on Barcelona, and and I've 
I started working on that in December. I just went back last week to shoot a, f a few more signs. And just in, that, in those two months since I've been away, some of the signs that I shot in December have already disappeared. Mm. So I, I do feel the sense of urgency to uh, try to document as much as possible before it's too late. Is there another city you're dreaming of doing after, after Barcelona? After Barcelona? I think this might be it. Oh. Although in Spain, everybody kept telling me I have to go to Porto next in Portugal. Oh. But I don't know. It's, it's a lot of work. Yeah, tremendous amount of work. Uh, do you have a favorite letter of the alphabet? No, but I have a, a, a least favorite letter. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think is many, many, for many people, it's, a, it's not a favorite. It's the a J. Don't you find that? Does anybody have a a problem with J's? <laughs> yes, you do. I do, and I, my sister-in-law's name starts with J, and I right? every time I write it. <laughs> well, the other, the, the other answer is, you know, it's, it's like everybody hates their own handwriting. Yeah. Everybody hates their own initials. And sure. I still remember when I was a kid, and I used to go to my watercolor class every Saturday, and I used to have to sign my name on, um, on the damp paper in pencil, which is pretty hard to do, and I used to, it used to really annoy me. So I decided to come up with a monogram instead. <laughs> right? I was like eight years old. And um, that's when I found out that you can't put an L and an F together without it looking like a swastika. <laughs> so that's when I, when I started my studio, Louise Feely LTD, I had a choice between LF or LFL, and either way it looks like a swastika. <laughs> so that's why I had to do it in script. At least you don't have BM. <laughs> <laughs> that was rough. That is rough. It still is. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Moving on. Yeah. Uh, have there been challenges or surprises relating to designing type for both wood and pixels? Uh, yes. <laughs> I, 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 uh, it's two completely different worlds, and it's it's. Um, uh, so in this project, I uh, it was probably good that I that I didn't know a lot of what I should have known about designing for wood, because I, I didn't really, and it wasn't until we started designing the poster that I thought, oh, I guess we should just do these in alternating, uh, these lines in alternating red and black, because uh, otherwise they're not going to be able to do this. So, you know, so two passes through the press might make it easier. But um, yeah, there are a lot of, it's, it's, it's two completely different things, and, um, and since I'm not an expert in either one, it's, it, w it was a, a real challenge. Do you think, that, I mean, in your, uh, what I often tell my students and young designers is that design is about limitations, right? And so this whole notion of constraints on a design project, whether it was choosing something that was futurist and then, all right, we've got seven of these letters, do you relish that opportunity to then, and was it, was it a boxing match to get those done, or was it? Oh no, it was great. It was it was very challenging, but um, I always like having the, the, uh, being put in a situation where I, I have to um, do something that I don't really know how to do. <laughs> you know, I, I think it forces me to use another side of my brain that will hopefully keep me from getting Alzheimer's too quickly. <laughs> well, you came back a second time, so we must yes. not have <laughs> That's spoiled true. it for you. So. Um, last question I have, and it's a bit self-serving, but... Um, Those are the best ones, yes. <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, what is the relevance or the value of a, of a printing museum, or even a type museum in the 21st century? Um. What... Um, you, you travel all over the world, you look at three-dimensional typography, whether it's signage or at Tipoteca or other places, why are we still so ensconced with it in the digital age? Mm. Well, I don't know if you remember, but I mentioned this to you when I was here uh, for Ways Goose. What really impressed me so much at Ways Goose was the first day when I arrived and watching Mardell working with Georgie, uh, sort of passing on the, 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 the whole process of, of cutting with a pantograph. And I, I, I thought that was very moving to see it being transferred to a, a new generation. 
And it really reminded, has anyone ever heard of the movie Fahrenheit 451? Oh, yes. oh, yeah. Hi. Next slide. <laughs> okay. For those of you who don't, and don't confuse this with Fahrenheit 9-11, that got its name from Fahrenheit 451. Fahrenheit 451 was, was a, a film by Francois Truffaut, and it was based on a story by Ray, Ray Bradbury, and it's science fiction, which is not my genre, but it's a great movie. And, um, and so in the film, books are banned, and they have firemen to come to burn your books. Uh, and Oscar Werner is one of the firemen, but then he starts getting curious and he, he picks up one of the books before, that he's supposed to burn. He starts reading it and then he starts stockpiling more and more books. And, and in the end, he escapes with the lovely Julie Christie. Next slide. And they go to, uh, to the woods and uh, they, they each have one book that they have to memorize and then they burn it. And, there's, um, and they, they just kind of walk around, they, each, each person is reciting his or her own book. But it was very moving, there was an old man who's lying on his deathbed and he's, he's transferring his book to this young boy. And, and you, you hear him uh, reciting it and the, the young boy is, is memorizing it. And, it really reminded me of seeing um, Mardell and Georgie working together and just passing it on. So I thought that was very nice. Very good. That's a great answer. Well, glad they had the pictures on Google Images. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, well, let's open it up to the group. Does anyone have questions that they'd like to ask or observations or insights? Yes. We were talking a little bit about some of the book cover designs that you had done, but I was curious just a little bit about that process because when you are redesigning, say, a product or, or a logo, you have so much of the knowledge of the product, whereas with the book, it's more of an ambiguous thing. No, because with the book, I read it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not everybody does that. <laughs> but. Um, <clears throat> Um, yeah, I, I think it's a similar process. It's, uh, it's, it's really like with a book, when I was doing book covers, I would read the book first and then, uh, and, and then I would usually, my process would be that I would sit down with a tracing pad and I would draw uh, an eight and a half by five and a half rectangle, which actually eight and nine sixteenths by five and seven sixteenths, which I can do with my eyes closed. And, uh, and then I would just write the title of the book over and over again, page after page, and just let the title sort of speak to me. And it would go just from a rough scribble into something a lot tighter, and, and then by the, you know, maybe the 50th page, it would be a, a real letter form, and it was usually something that didn't exist, and then I had to figure out how to, have, how to make that. Um, and, and I, I don't even think I realized it at the time, but it was sort of preparing me for the way I design logos now. It's sort of the same thing. And so now, uh, you know, instead of reading the book, I, t I sit down and talk to the client. I go visit the facility, whether it's a restaurant or a, a jam factory or whatever. And, and of course, I taste the product. And if it's not good, I wouldn't take the job. Um, and, and then I, I kind of uh, extrapolate that into, um, into the typography. Mm -hmm. So, because somehow, because I, I, for me a logo is, is a typographic portrait. You have to find a way for the typography to express uh, the qualities of, of the product. So, yes. Okay. So, you know, you've had years of drawing and sketching and thumbnails, whatever. Do you keep your notebooks? Do you have notebooks from 20 years ago? Oh, funny you should or ask. Do you purge, or how do you, yeah. like, that's kind of, well. The funny you should ask that, because I'm having a, retros uh, a major retrospective exhibit in New York in Octo next October that you're all invited to. <laughs> you should come. And I just found out about it just a couple months ago. and. Um, and when the gallery director called me, uh, this, is, this is part of SVA, it's the School of Visual Arts, it's the master's series, and they, they don't always do it every year, it depends. Um, but when he called, he said, remember, this is a retrospective, so we want to see everything. They, so that meant they wanted to see those watercolor drawings with yeah. my monogram. 
Well, it just so happens that Steve and I just moved out of the apartment a year ago that we had lived in for 32 years, and I got rid of everything. <laughs> um, I got rid of a lot, I mean, so did he. But um, I just thought, I've got all this stuff, and I don't want my son to have to go through it in, in another 20 years. I, you know, I, I've looked at it now, I've seen it enough times, I can get rid of it, and I just got rid of it. So, and it's, but it's okay. I still have, I still have sketches that I try to keep, because I, I always, I, I do like seeing the sketches, and, and when I did my monograph, I, the publisher specifically asked to show, that we show process spreads, and I think it's, it is really helpful to see that, and, and I always like going back and looking at sketches, just to see like how, how close the sketch is to the final product, and, and which I always enjoyed looking at for poster designers and paintings, everything. So, um, yeah, so I don't know what my advice is about this. I, I, I think you should take digital photos of all your stuff and then get rid of it. <laughs> or sell it on eBay. Yeah. Yes? Does your uh, interest in futurism extend beyond typographic treatments? Like, it seemed like well, your speaking Italian was a reference to Bruno Minari's book. And yes. Okay. Right. Well, futurism meaning like futurist painting and um, I'm, I'm really more interested in the typography, I think, and, then, and anything by DePero, of course. Um, but there's just something about that typography that I think, you know, after doing the, the um, Italian sign book and then doing the French book and now doing Barcelona, I see that every city kind of seems to have its own, not its own style, but it has a different approach to, um, to their signage. Like, you know, you, you would never, confuse a Paris sign for an Italian sign. And, um, but, it, but, in, but then of course in Italy, every city is completely different too. Like Rome definitely had, I had an eclectic chapter in that book and um, it was the biggest chapter in the book but, and most of, the, most of the examples came from Rome because in Rome it's just kind of like, you know, fuck you, this is, <laughs> I've got this big storefront and I'm gonna do something outrageous. Um, but um, I don't know where I was going with this, but um, but anyway, um, yeah. So, but it's but it's really the the futurist typography that I think is the most unique and 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 is is the most Italian. So, yes. Do you know anything about the font used in the Paris metro station? It always kind of uh, reminds me of a Toulouse track or something. Oh, the Art Nouveau. Right. Yeah. Well, that um, Hector Guimard designed the, the 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 stations themselves, and uh, I, I think he just did the typography too. It's it's beautiful, and there's there's still a lot of them left, which is good for Paris. <laughs> although although somewhere there's a website somewhere that that lists like where all the other ones have gone and they're all over the world they have them in Japan <laughs> it's it's pretty amazing how they let them go other questions well thank you thank you and thank you everybody thank you all. We'll spend a little time talking, and then maybe we go over to the press, and if we can give yes. some demos of some printing, um, oh, that, that would be would great. Fun. And um, uh, just what a thrill, as always. Very, well, very it's, greatly it's appreciated. It's really thrilling to be here. Thanks to and you all for coming as well. Thank you.